welcome um, to this webinar. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We have people from different regions uh, joining um, this session uh, today. Uh, just a second. My name is Mauro Calvary-Grispan. I am the executive director of GATE, and I'm going to be facilitating this um, webinar. Originally, the idea was to do it with a colleague. Our colleague couldn't attend uh, the session today, so uh, I will be in charge of facilitating it. So this um, webinar uh, is going to be, sorry, and a second. Uh, this webinar is going to be introductory, which means that if you have already been engaged in processes such as the, the, the revision and reform of the international classification of diseases, probably some of the information that, that you are going uh, to learn today will be um, already um, known by, by you. Uh, but however, we, we hope to introduce new people to this process and to address new and pressing issues uh, concerning trans and gender diverse people, the pathologization. As Nabon said, we're going to have a presentation and then a, a Q&A. You're going to receive a post-webinar survey that we would really appreciate if you could uh, complete. And we also want to announce that this webinar is the first training webinar on depathologization and human rights in our 2020 series. We do this um, every year, and this is the first one this year. So this webinar is happening in the context of Trans Advocacy Week, and actually it is the first uh, activity in Trans Advocacy Week 2020. Trans Advocacy Week is a project co-organized by TGU, APTN, ILGA World, RFSL, and GATE. We usually come together at the June session of the Human Rights um, Council in, in Geneva for a week of training, strategic planning, side events, meetings, and we usually produce statements uh, on different UN-related processes. In the case of 2020 and because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, Trans Advocacy Week is going to happen virtually. As I said, I am the executive director of GATE. GATE is an international organization that works on issues related to gender identity, gender expressions, and sex characteristics. We are uh, 10 years old. We were founded 10 years ago. We are a, a multi-issue community-led organization. It means that we work on a diversity of issues, including HIV, movement building and resourcing, UN, socioeconomic justice, and depathologization and that our leadership is, is trans, gender diverse, and intersex. And you can find us in, in our website, as you can see there in the slide, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So our work on depathologization, it's focused on a diversity of issues. We are working on psychomedical depathologization, but also on um, on legal, sorry, on legal depathologization. We are addressing pathologization as a human rights issue, focusing specifically in the intersection between uh, the right to health and the right to be freedom of torture. We are addressing the socioeconomic uh, components of pathologization by um, engaging in the processes on universal health coverage and also on the SDG processes, focusing specifically in the intersection between uh, health and poverty. We are working in uh, so-called gender ideology issues, focusing on how uh, anti-gender organizing is contributing to repathologize trans and gender diverse people. And, and right now we are conducting researches in, at the global level, focusing Central Europe and Ukraine and Latin America in general and Brazil um, specifically. 
we work um, providing training and toolkits and other resources, but also investing in um, investing in resourcing or, or movements. In this webinar specifically, we are going to address some key definitions uh, and processes related trans and gender diverse depathologization. We're going to explore where we are right now in, on the road to depathologize trans and gender diverse people. And we are going to explore some of the key challenges and opportunities in this process. I'm sorry for the interruption, but Nabon, I need your help to close the question, uh, the, the Q&A window if possible. There That's should be, um, there should be just a, an Xbox where you can just exit it. Just, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. No and so, sorry for the interruption. Okay, and now, okay. So if we focus um, on pathologization as an issue, it is defined as a structural practice um, that is focused on identifying certain traits, behaviors, individuals, or even communities as intrinsically disorders, and other traits, behaviors, individuals, and communities as intrinsically healthy. It happens, for example, when the behavior is, is identified as same-sex attraction, for example, and gay and lesbian people are identified as intrinsically disorder, and heterosexual people are identified, for example, as intrinsically healthy. It happens to trans people whose gender identities, gender expressions, and in general, generally our experiences and our lives are identifying as intrinsically disordered in comparison to cis people whose um, lives, experiences, gender identities, and expressions are structurally identified as intrinsically healthy. For trans and, and, and gender diverse uh, people, Pathologi pathologization is not only about being considered a disordered person or a person suffering from a, a disorder, a sickness, a, a disease, or a disorder. Uh, because pathologization in the, fo in the form of different um, diagnostic categories is regulating currently, is currently regulating or access to legal gender recognition or access to gender affirming healthcare and or access um, to healthcare coverage. The consequences of pathologizations, or, or at least um, some of them for trans and gender diverse people um, are three. First, pathologization naturalized reinforces and justifies hierarchies. For example, the cis people over trans people. It means, for example, that when it comes to, to do about debates on human rights, many cis people consider that it is okay to debate uh, trans people access to basic rights, for example, legal gender recognition. It reduces or denies trans and gender diverse people's autonomy and self-determination, for example, uh, because it requires a medical or a psychological expert to assess if a person is really a trans person or not, or if a trans person is really a man or a woman. Pathologization promotes and justifies human rights violations, for example, requirement for legal gender recognition, but also by promoting conversion therapies. And it restricts con uh, the access to ba basic human rights. Um, by imposing requirements that are incompatible with human rights standards. For example, when it's required a, psycho a psychiatric diagnosis to allow a child to have access to a school bathroom, or for example, when it required people a diagnosis in order to get access to healthcare coverage. So over the last 10 years, 
uh, trans and gender diverse, activ diverse activists have been um, organizing at the, at the international, regional, and national level on political movements on depathologization. And the key goals of these uh, movements has been to remove pathologizing language from psychomedical classifications and ensuring full access to legal gender recognition, gender affirming healthcare, and its coverage. Many people believe, and I don't know if that's the case or not, of the people attending this webinar, that when we talk about depathologization, we are only talking about the first sentence, removing pathologizing language from psychomedical classification. However, I want you to have in mind that there is no chance of getting trans and gender diverse people fully depathologize if we don't ensure that depathologization is compatible with, with full access to legal gender recognition, gender affirming healthcare, and its coverage. So what you can see here in this slide are the key core and principles shared by trans and gender diverse movements working on depathologization. We affirm that being trans and or gender diverse is not a pathology. We affirm that we must have full access to legal gender recognition without pathologizing requirements, for example, requ requiring um, a diagnosis in order to get uh, a gender marker changed. We believe that trans and gender diverse people must have access to gender affirming procedures on the only base of informed consent, which means that people uh, should have access to uh, hormonal treatments and surgical procedures without the requirement of uh, di a diagnosis. We believe that gender affirming healthcare must be fully covered, uh, which implies to include gender affirming healthcare under universal healthcare coverage. We believe that victims of human rights violations related to pathologization must have full access to truth, rehabilitation, and reparations. And we believe in racial and socioeconomic justice, decolonization, and international solidarity. And this last point is particularly uh, important because at this moment, there are countries where it is possible for trans people to be depathologized, while in other countries, it's still not possible and or struggle it based in the principle of not leaving um, no one behind. So the key strategies followed by um, depathologizing movements um, are the following. We have been working, introducing depathologization as a key human rights issue by engaging with UN mechanisms, for example, with the Special Rapporteur on Torture and the Special Rapporteur uh, on Health, uh, but also with the independent expert on SOGI issues and reporting on human rights violations. We have been building and sharing, uh, sharing technical expertise among our movement and our allies. We have been monitoring and supporting processes of legal depathologization, for example, by supporting strategic litigation and legal reform at the country level. We have been producing key resources, for example, papers that have been published in peer review journals and other kind of articles. We have been building key alliances with other movements um, uh, working on depathologization, including, for example, the intersex movement and the movement of people living with disabilities. We have been facilitating political mobilization by supporting access um, to resources, including funding. And we have been engaging with the revision and reform uh, with revision and reform processes uh, of psychomedical classification, and particularly on the revision and reform of the international classification of diseases. The international classification of diseases um, has been one of the key targets of um, trans and gender diverse organizing on depathologization because it is produced by the World Health Assembly and approved by uh, the World, uh, sorry, it's produced by the World Health Organization and it's approved by the World Health Assembly. It is used uh, all around the world as a standard diagnosis tool. It is public, it is free. It includes all kinds of conditions, including non-pathologizing categories and chapters, and it was under revision. I'm saying all of this because Many times we got the question 
um, on why focusing in this classification and not focusing, for example, on the um, diagnostic and statistic manual on mental health disorders uh, known as DSM. Well, basically because the DSM is produced by one organization, the, Ameri the American Psychiatric Associ uh, Association. It is used in less countries, is focused only on mental health uh, issues. It is not public, it is not uh, free. And the process of reviewing the international classification of diseases was open to civil society part participation, while the DSM um, revision process was closed to civil society participation. These are the key reasons why our um, uh, political and technical organizing have revolved around the international classification of diseases. So in ICD-10, which is the 10th version of the classification, is a version that was approved in uh, 1990, uh, trans-related categories were included in chapter five on mental and behavioral disorders. And you can see here the list of uh, categories that were used to classify trans and gender diverse people. Um, as you can see, the, the language is extremely pathologizing and there is a, a combination between um, the language itself, for example, in F64.2, like gender identity disorders, all these categories were considered uh, gender uh, identity disorders in general, and there, there is one particularly focused on, on children. Um, but also that they were included in this chapter on mental health, which make, by definition, trans and gender diverse people, people suffering from a mental disorder, being that mental disorder, well, their identities. ICD-10 is still in use. And this is in red because uh, it has two key meanings. It means that uh, even when ICD-11 have been approved, the process of implementation will still take some years, which means that ICD-10 is still the standard diagnostic tool used in many countries of the world. It also means that some countries, for example, the US, have just adopted ICD-10. So um, uh, it means that for them to get to ICD-11 will take even longer. So something important to have in mind is that states don't have any obligation to update the, their own classification systems to make them compatible with uh, the international classification of diseases. In ICD-11, um, trans-related um, categories have been moved to a new chapter. The chapter is chapter 17 on conditions related to sexual health. And all the previous, um, if you re um, remind, all these uh, categories have been deleted. And now we have um, three new categories. One is the parent category called gender incongruence. And this category has two uh, subcategories. One is gender incongruence of adolescent and adulthood. The other one is gender incongruence of childhood. If you want to visit um, ICD-11, there is um, a link here that can be shared also later, you know, after the, the presentation, if you want to explore ICD-11. So the definition of gender incongruence that you can see right now, if you enter the system, has two parts. One is the definition itself, and the other one, it's an exclusion. Um, so as you can see, the definition, um, neither the definition nor the exclusion um, are binary. There is not such a thing as cross identification between male or, or female. And, but at the same time, there is a, a very strong principle in terms of uh, keeping gender variance or gender diversity uh, out of the classification. So I will share with you um, 
the two key classific um, the two key categories being proposed. So this is the category proposed for gender. Sorry, it's the category already in the in the in ICD 11 on gender incongruence of adolescents and, and adulthood. I will give you a moment to read it. I keep repeating proposed because the process has been so long. It has been, it started in 2012. Uh, sorry, it, it started in, in uh, 2000, 2008 and was supposed to be finished in 2012, but actually was finished last year. So, and this is the category, uh, the category for gender incongruence of childhood. Again, in these two categories is reaffirmed that gender variance cannot in itself be identified as a pathology. So if we compare what we have before in ICD-10 and ICD-11, if we compare gender identity disorders with gender incongruence, we can find uh, like some, some um, differences. Gender identity is a disorder and in ICD-10, in ICD but gender incongruence is a condition in uh, ICD-11. So in that sense, it's not a full depathologization but uh, it is not a mental health issue, it's a condition related, it's not a mental health disorder, it's a condition related to sexual, to sexual health. Uh, so in that sense, it's considered to be more benign. Gender identity disorder was focused on the identity of the person, which means that if you were trans, uh, just because of your gender identity, um, you receive the the you you can apply to you could apply to have uh, this diagnosis in the case of gender incongruence is based in the personal experience of the person so in that sense gender identity disorder was universal what it means universal it means that uh, if you were a trans person it means that you have the disorder in the case of gender in, uh, incongruence is supposed to be restricted only to those people that declare the experience of gender incongruence. It means that if you're a trans or gender diverse person, but you don't experience gender incongruence as your personal subjective experience, it means that the category doesn't apply to you. In the case of gender identity disorder, it didn't have an exit clause. An exit clause means a condition uh, by which you stop having a diagnosis. Because for example, you got cured. In the case of the gender identity disorder, the only way of getting cured was stop being yourself. So, uh, because your identity was the disorder, the only way of getting rid of the, that diagnosis is to stop being yourself. In the case of gender incongruence, once that the individual declares um, that they have reached uh, congruence or an experience of congruence or the feelings of congruence, the, diag the diagnosis is su supposed to stop applying. So in that sense, it, it has an exit clause. It is possible to stop having gender incongruence. In the case of the gender identity disorder, it is a binary system where people identify as, uh, were assigned male at, at birth and identify as female or were assigned female at birth and identify as male and that was their gender identity disorder. In the case of gender incongruence, there is no, no mention, mention to the gender binary. So these are uh, the key uh, points to compare. It doesn't mean that gender incongruence is perfect, is a bit better than the gender identity disorder, but it already uh, it has many different problems that still need to be solved. So what we think that where we are now in, in this process, you have to know that the technical process of revision of reform concluded in 2018. This process was conducted by the World Health Organization and its different, different technical teams. And it has a very intense uh, participation from uh, trans and gender diverse organizations involved in the, the pathologization process. 
the World Health Assembly that is integrated by all uh, state members, which basically means all uh, countries in the world, approved ICD-11 in 2019, which means that ICD-11 and in that sense, the removal of um, psychopathologizing categories in ICD-11, uh, it's a reality since last year. However, there is always a however in this. ICD only will start being implemented in two, uh, 2000. And, and this is important. It's important to have you know, that question mark because we don't know what the imp impact of COVID-19 is going to be in the implementation process. So if we move to what are the next steps in political uh, organizing uh, around uh, trans and gender diverse depathologization. From the very beginning of the process, we have been uh, focused in getting rid of all categories pathologizing uh, trans and gender diverse children and children in general in the context of trans and, and gender diversity. Why? Because if you remember, um, the I ICD codes and, and categories are used to ensure access to healthcare and its coverage, in particular to surgeries and hormones. In the case of children, in the case of trans and gender diverse children and all children exploring their sexual orientation, their gender identity and the gender expression, there are um, no hormonal treatments or um, surgical procedures to be covered. Therefore, there is no need to have a category pathologizing children. It has been said that trans and gender diverse children and all children exploring their identities and expressions and sexualities could need, for example, support to deal with rejection, uh, to deal with uh, experiences of homophobia, lesbophobia, and transphobia, uh, to deal with unsupporting uh, families, uh, school and communities, uh, to deal with anxiety and with the traumatizing experiences of violence. But for all those situations, the international classification of diseases already have categories that can be used to cover, for example, counseling or psychological therapy and even psychiatric um, uh, treatment. So in that sense, there is no need uh, for the international classification of diseases to have a category pathologizing children. So we have been working, our first submission to the World Health Organization on gender incongruence of childhood happened in 2013. So we have been working over the past seven years trying to depathologize trans and gender diverse children. We want the international classification of diseases to include a reference that allow trans people in different parts of the world to get access to gender, uh, to legal gender recognition transitional healthcare and its coverage, but that category needs to have a better name than gender incongruence because gender incongruence itself, it's a stigmatizing and, and, uh, and a stigmatizing uh, category and it reintroduced uh, congruence as a normative ideal. We want a better name, a better definition, I criteria for the category that right now is called gender incongruence of adolescence and adulthood. We want uh, it to be effective to cover for, for um, gender affirming healthcare and its coverage. We want it to work to cover from puberty blockers to um, um, lifetime treatments for trans uh, adults and, and elders, but without having the stigmatizing uh, language of gender incongruence. We are working monitoring the implementation of ICD-11 at the country level to see how different ministries of health are starting to explore um, how the system is going to work with ICD-11 when compare, uh, comparing it with the implementation of ICD-10. And there is a key issue here, which is that because uh, trans and gender diverse related categories have been removed from the mental health chapter and located in the new chapter on sexual health, 
um, it is key to know who are going to be the, the health providers in charge of managing that chapter. It is going to be uh, the current health providers or if sexologists are going to have a more engaged participation in trans and gender diverse people uh, access to healthcare. We are engaging with revisions and updates, uh, which means that we keep engaging, making submissions, trying to get language change and getting rid of gender incongruence of childhood. That process is still uh, open. And the first uh, update right now is dated for 2024. And we are engaging in elaboration of guidelines and protocols for the implementation of um, ICD-11. We are doing that by working with the, health, uh, the World Health Organization, by working with um, WPATH, like the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, with the World Association for Sexual Health, WAS, but also developing our own uh, material in, in our own uh, activist working groups. So let's move to um, some ch the, the challenges that I, you know, at, at the beginning of the webinar, I said that we were going to be talking about challenges and, and opportunities. And even when I would love to say that um, we have more opportunities with chal than challenges, actually we have more challenges than opportunities. But I really hope that, that we are going to make it work. So as I said, uh, the implementation period is supposed to start in two years from now. But honestly, no one knows if that's going to happen or not. And because of all the delays and because of the current uh, pandemic, we are um, already foreseeing that it's going to be a delay in the implementation date. We don't know if that delay implies that, um, that ICD-10 is going to be used uh, as it is right now. And I'm saying this because even from the World Health Organization, it was very clear that identifying trans and gender diverse people as mentally disordered people was violating our human rights. And in that sense, uh, we really hope to work with the World Health Organization and with different countries in order to start implementing the chapter on sexual health even before 2022 or you know, around that uh, time. Even if they need more time to implement, to fully implement ICD-11, we really believe that the chapter concerning trans and gender diverse people must be implemented as soon as possible. In terms of, of adjustments, as I said before, we need to know what is going to happen with health providers and how they are going to adapt to this new environment. And, and not only because of the new categories, but because these new categories imply different um, rights at stake, uh, including the right to get access to gender affirming procedures uh, using informed consent as the key, as the key tool. This will require not only a lot of training for health providers, but also a very uh, close monitoring strategy from uh, activists and civil society organizations in general to ensure that ICD implementation is fully compatible with human rights principles supporting um, the new version of the international classification of diseases. There is a second challenge in uh, as, um, adjustment that has to do with national laws and policies. Uh, because in many countries, um, ICD categories are used to, um, to decide who gets access to legal gender recognition and who is denied uh, access to legal gender recognition. And in that sense, we need laws and policies to be compatible with human rights standards and to be compatible with uh, ICD-11. In that sense, requiring a mental health diagnosis uh, to, to get access to legal gender recognition, right now, since 2019, it is incom it's not compatible with ICD-11. And in that sense, legal depathologization becomes um, a priority. The third adjustment and this is really critical, is coverage. We need to know, and 
uh, and we are only going to know when this is start to be implemented if the new codes are going to provide full coverage for gender affirming procedures, including hormonal treatments and surgeries. It has to do with the chapter, what, what means if the chapter on conditions related uh, to sexual health will provide the same level of coverage that the current chapter on mental health we need to see if the categories of related with gender incongruence will provide the same level of coverage or a better level of coverage that categories based on gender identity disorders. And we also have the problem of DSM-5 because DSM-5 is used in the US, which means that uh, in the US, trans and gender diverse people, in order to get access to gender affirming procedures and it, their coverage, we need a mental health diagnosis until DSM. Remember that DSM is only for mental disorders. And in the rest of the world, trans and gender diverse people should have access to gender affirming procedures using an ICD-11 category, which is a condition related with sexual health. We don't know how this contradiction is going to work in the US and how both these systems are going to get compatible. We are hopeful that a compatibility with full coverage will be uh, obtained, uh, but again, it will depend on the future, and not only on the future of the ICD-11, but the future of the US and its government and administration. We need to ensure that trans and gender diverse people are included in the implementation at the country level, which is not uh, the case right now, where we are seeing actually it's a structural exclusion of trans and gender diverse uh, experts from implementation processes. And we are going to see uh, structural issues aggravated by COVID-19, uh, in including uh, what is happening already in different, uh, in different countries with the identification of trans and gender diverse people healthcare as not essential and therefore uh, relegated to better times. We are also facing three kinds of related political challenges. We are seeing um, anti-gender organizing against so-called gender ideology and they're called to repathologize trans and gender diverse people and that's coming from far right uh, parties and organizations from religious uh, groups and institutions, and even from feminist groups and individuals. We are seeing uh, in different countries, in, many, in, in, in different regions, calls to reduce trans and gender diverse children's human rights uh, by imposing, for example, or, or asking to impose longer, longer waiting times um, to acknowledge the right to uh, gender identity and gender, and gender expression. And this idea that uh, children need to be protected from uh, gender ideology and then uh, it is better to risk their access to legal gender recognition, for example, or even to counseling and support on gender identity and gender expression issues. And we are also seeing governments, including the US government, cutting out access to gender affirming healthcare, which is um, exactly the, the opposite of what it, the pathologization activism is about. Some of the, I, I, you know, we put fake news as a title here. Maybe we can find out a better way of expressing that. But it's a storm of uh, affirmations related to the, the situation of trans and gender diverse people. All what we are seeing here is real. And we have seen that not only in social media, but in traditional media and even in peer review journals. So this idea that the trans or the LGTB lobby is controlling the World Health Organization and then that, um, that the pathologization needs to be reversed because it's actually the outcome of a political, the very successful and wealthy political lobby and is not grounded on scientific and human rights principles. We have this idea uh, that it's becoming extremely common and dangerous right now that trans people's rights are incompatible with women's rights and therefore that depatrogization is putting women at risk. Um, 
we have many people, including people working uh, in psychomedical institutions, affirming that trans people exist in large numbers because of social media. And we saw recently the emergence of a new uh, diagnosis called the rapid onset gender dysphoria uh, that says basically that children and teenagers are becoming trans because of what their friends are doing or because of their exposure, ex exposure to social media. Um, we are seeing people saying, including many um, feminist activists, saying that it's necessary to protect trans people against themselves uh, or uh, from their parents and from doctors uh, trying to impose, or because, because we are mentally disordered people that need to be protected against our desires, or because our parents are mentally disordered people that make, are making us trans, or because doctors uh, are trying to make experiments with mentally disordered people. And we have many calls around the world calling to distinguish between true trans people, for example, those suffering from a real mental disorder, from those people just exploring their options and probably desisting later. If we move to the key opportunities to continue in the process of trans and gender diverse depathologization, the engagement with the ICD process is for us the key opportunity right now, and this is still an open process. The language coming from the independent expert on SOGI, and on SOGI issues, and for those that maybe don't know the expression SOGI means uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, the mandate uh, of the independent expert have been fully supportive of trans and gender diverse depathologization and engaging with the mandate is one of our key opportunities right now. Both the Yogyakarta principles and the Yogyakarta principles plus 10 on the application of um, international human rights law to sexual orientation, gender uh, identity, gender expression and sex characteristics have strong language on depathologization we are seeing processes of legal depathologization happen uh, and advancing in some countries of the world. And we have very good uh, gender identity laws uh, being implemented already or being, dis uh, or being discussed. There is an international focus right now on conversion therapies that open a big opportunity uh, to present the connection between pathologization and conversion or reparative therapies. We have built 10 years of technical and political expertise uh, among trans and gender diverse um, movements, which means that our, our movements are ready to engage with the next steps in this process. And over the last years, we have seen more and more funding supporting activism on trans and gender diverse people depathologization Right now, we don't know, again, how the COVID-19 pandemic is going to affect trans and gender diverse organizing um, and access to funding in general and particularly on these issues. So if you are wondering what you can do um, around these issues, I mean, I, in this Call. They are people that are already uh, engaging, and they are people that maybe are new to to this field. So these key actions are for for everyone, especially to those of you that are thinking about, you know, what how you can start engaging with these processes. So we recommend people to find out and share key information. And this information has to do with, you know, finding out what is the situation of trans people in your country in terms of depathologization and, and how um, gender affirming procedures are covered. If people have to pay for them out of pocket, if they are covered by private insurance, uh, the public health system, um, do these systems require um, a diagnosis or, or just, you know, they are covered as a matter of law? You can find out if your government is planning to adopt and implement ICD-11 when or if it's not planning to do it. Um, you can find out if trans and gender diverse people are included in law and policy work on legal depathologization. And, 
and this is really important, you can also try to find out why activists need in your, uh, in your country and to support them in getting their needs met. We need allies and more and more people involved in um, addressing, identifying, addressing and dismantling patrogization in traditional media and social media to debunk uh, fake news related to trans people, for example, the trans people are taking over the World Health Organization. We want people to engage and dismantle pathologizing interactions in daily life. And we know that that's difficult to correct people or just to introduce new thoughts uh, on what being trans and gender diverse mean. We need um, people to address and dismantle trans and gender diverse uh, people's exclusion from key processes, which means basically asking uncomfortable questions, including where are the trans people in the room if we are going to talk about trans issues. And to identify, address and dismantle cissexism, for example, in medical practice. In terms of mobilizing support, Activist organizations and networks and initiatives working on depatologization need different forms of support from funding to support in regard to uh, well-being because engaging with pathologization is an extremely toxic uh, process. We need support to monitor implementing strategies. We need support for monitoring and reporting strategies which means opening, spa uh, opening space to receive, uh, to receive reports, to read reports, to comment on, on reports provided by trans and gender diverse uh, groups. We need support with communication strategies. And in that sense, it would be fantastic if you can engage in um, sharing the pathologizing post in your, in your social media, or contributing to make more visible activism against, the, um, against pathologization. And we need support in developing better funding uh, strategies in order to support international, regional, and um, national activism on depathologization. Finally, we need you to engage. And there are different avenues for engagement. You can engage in the process of the revision and update of the international classification of diseases in the implementation process, in processes of legal depathologization at the country level. You can engage in the process of universal healthcare coverage, and you can engage in on campaigns to debunk, uh, to debunk gender ideology issues in traditional media and in social media. You can engage with media itself by producing uh, content. And of course, you can engage in our activism on depathologization. And I'm going to close this presentation by providing our email address. This email address uh, that connects with our area of work on depathologization and human rights, including gender ideology and legal depathologization and torture in healthcare settings. It's just an entry point. There are many others. And all the members of the Trans Advocacy Week, remember TGU, APTN, um, ILGA World, RFSL, uh, work, uh, we work together in a partnership with other many organizations uh, on trans and gender diverse depatologization. Then please uh, reach out, uh, contact uh, us, and let's work together to make uh, trans and gender diverse depatologization a reality. Thank you. And now I think that we have a bit of time for questions.
if, if people have uh, additional questions, just after, remember that after this, this session, we are going to receive a survey. It includes the possibility of um, asking questions and, and you can always contact uh, us and the other um, partners in Trans Advocacy Week for, for additional information. Let me see. No, I, I can see if... Elisa, are you going to ask the question by writing or... No, no, I'm not going to ask any question. Ah, sorry, sorry then. Sorry for the confusion. I'm sorry. Yeah. So if that if we don't have other questions or um, or comments, we are going to end this session. Uh, this session here, uh, it's going to be. We have recorded it, so it's going to be um, available online, and uh, including the the PowerPoint uh, presentation. There's one more question here, Mara, from yes. Igor and Kamidola. Uh, will you include in strategy economic sustainable activities? Because of COVID, we see how trans people are vulnerable. Well, there are many activities related with, uh, with that. Um, what we are seeing right now is, is so, so just to, to put my answer in context, GATE is an, is an international organization. So we don't work, we don't work, I'm, I'm sorry, just, just a second because I have a, just one, one moment. Okay. I have a puppy emergency. Um, we, don't, we don't provide uh, assist, economic assistance at the country level. No, we, are not a, we are not a donor. What we are trying to, what we are doing is monitoring what is happening with trans people and gender diverse people and intersex people access to healthcare, including genital healthcare in the, con uh, like uh, access in, in general, uh, which in some cases has been reduced or, or, or challenged because of mobility uh, restrictions, but also because of discrimination and stigma in healthcare facilities. What is happening with trans and gender diverse and intersex people access to COVID-19 specific healthcare, but again, uh, can be challenged because of stigma and, and discrimination. And what's happening with access to gender uh, affirming um, treatments. And in that case, what we are seeing that in different countries, surgeries has been postponed uh, or, or follow up uh, revisions after surgery uh, has been postponed. Uh, the trans uh, and gender diver diverse specific healthcare has uh, been identified as non-essential, and that's extremely that's extremely problematic. Of course, in those countries with trans and gender diverse people have to pay for their surgeries and hormones out of pocket. The crisis, the economic crisis related with COVID-19, is having and it's going to have a huge impact. So in that sense, I think that in the very near future, we will need to organize globally to see um, in, in which way trans and gender diverse people can be supported in access transition and healthcare in different countries of the different countries of the world. Because they don't have the money to pay for them in those countries where they, they have to pay. Or because, like for example, in the case of Argentina, where I am right now, because the state is poor and, and can't keep co uh, covering surgeries and hormones. And then it will be necessary to find out a way, a way of, ensuring, of ensuring access or to do the best to ensure, to ensure access. Thank you, Mauro. So that's the last of the questions that we have in our chat. Thank you very much, everyone, for um, for joining. Uh, thank you very much for the for the questions, and I really hope that we can count on you to engage in in this process on depatologization. It's been long; it's still uh, a long way to go, but we really believe that we are going to get there. Thank you very much, and thank you, Navon, for for your assistance. You're welcome. Have a good day, everyone.